Well, first a transition because John wants you to know where Jesus and the disciples are getting to. So we've been at Cana in Galilee in the north, a few miles away from Nazareth where Jesus grew up. Now we're going to go down to Capernaum on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Tiberias there. And Capernaum is where Jesus will be based for all of his ministry in the north in Galilee. So that town's going to come up a lot. You'll see that again. So he goes down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. Not everybody is so comfortable hearing about the brothers of Jesus. Why is that? Well, actually, for the first couple of hundred years, I don't think it was a problem at all. But starting in the 300s, it got to be a bit of a problem because, of course, at that time, we wanted to be able to say that Mary, the Virgin Mary that we talk about in the Apostles' Creed, was always a virgin, and therefore she couldn't have had children. And then... Later, after that, there became this idea that maybe Joseph, too, needed to be thrown into that category. And then things, I think, began to get a little strange. So some of the solutions are that Joseph was married before he married Mary, which is a lot harder to say than you would think. And he had children before that. So Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters that were older than he. Jesus is probably in his early 30s at this point. No reason to think that he has not had other siblings come along along the way. I think they are probably his younger brothers. I don't have any issue with that. I will say even one of the great reformers, John Calvin, could never quite get away from this and said, oh, these are, of course, Jesus' cousins. Right, because even though there's a word in Greek for cousins and they use brothers, it's his cousins. First cousins, really, or half-brothers and sisters. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Um, Almost certainly his siblings who came along after Jesus. In fact, one of his brothers, James, wrote the book of James and was one of the great leaders in the church in Jerusalem and was martyred there for his faith. Not at this point and not even in the next few chapters. His family is not necessarily going to be on board with this wandering rabbi idea or even those who are saying this might be the Messiah. Took a while for at least his siblings to come along there. Well, he's there in Capernaum for a few days, but only for a few days, setting up house probably because they have to go up to Jerusalem, which is a strange concept because they're going south. But you always go up to Jerusalem from wherever you're coming because it's on a hill and it's the city of God. So they go up to Jerusalem for the Passover, one of the three great feasts that all Jewish men were expected to attend if they at all could. At least if you you live far, far away, you were expected to make your way to Jerusalem at some point. And so Jesus goes up to Jerusalem as tons of people were doing. Jerusalem booms during the Passover, probably the biggest feast of the year, at least doubling, if not more, in size during this feast. So here we go. We're going up to Jerusalem. And he gets there, and he goes to the temple. Seems to be one of the first things he does. He goes to church almost immediately. And in the temple courts, Jesus finds people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables, exchanging money. And then we go from the meek and mild, sage wandering in uh, the promised land, teaching and being relatively harmless, to a man who is throwing people out of church. He is causing a huge uproar, a huge commotion. Everybody's gathering around wondering what's going on. This is not only the meek and mild Jesus we get to see here. Now, when I got up this morning, I wrote down a couple of questions. My first question was, Why are the people with the animals and the money changers in the temple? And that's an easy question to answer. The hardest question of all to answer this morning was my second question. Why is Jesus so upset about it? What is so upsetting about the fact that... Because if you go to the first question, why are they there? Well, they're there because... If you're going to the temple to worship, you have to have animals to sacrifice. You're going to have to have animals. And if you come from a long way away, you don't want to have to bring your sheep or your or, or your cow or even your doves a long way to Jerusalem, particularly not if they must be without blemish, without flaw. What if something were to happen on the way? If your uh, cow came up, or your bull, actually, you'll probably be sacrificing bulls. If your bull ended up coming up lame, when you get to Jerusalem, you can't sacrifice that animal. It has to be perfect. So it's for convenience sake that we have the animals right there because you're going to need animals to sacrifice and the people with the animals thought, won't this be convenient? If we're right here in these outer courts that aren't used that much, which begins to hint at why Jesus is so upset, in the outer courts of the temple, similarly, those sitting at the tables exchanging money, and we think this is a a horrible thing, exchanging currency in the temple, but again... Not only if you came from far away, you might have different currency than what was used in Jerusalem, but to pay the temple tax, every Jewish man 20 years and older had to pay a half shekel tax. We don't use shekels anymore, but a half shekel tax to keep up the temple every single year. 
And they wanted that tax, by the way, in a particular form of currency, the Tyrian uh, uh, coin. I don't know if they had half shekels in Tyre because that was up in what's now Lebanon. But they were traders, and so their currency was very pure. And so if you got silver from Tyre, you knew it was going to be exactly the amount that it said on it. And they liked that in the temple because they wanted to make sure they were getting their money's worth. So a certain weight of silver had to be paid, and then they would melt it down after that. So it's convenient, right? Wouldn't that be a good thing to have? I almost didn't tell the first service, but I told them, so I'm going to have to tell you too. And what I said in the first is you should know, after a couple of hours of thinking about it, you shouldn't have to know this. I'm going to tell you anyway. There are churches who decide for your convenience, George Casella, don't get any ideas, that we should put an ATM out in the Northex so that when you come to church, you can always be prepared for your offering. Didn't bring any money? The ATM's right out there next to the statue of Jesus. Very convenient. for Churches have gone farther than that. And rather than having just an ATM to get that cold, hard cash, how crass that is, they actually have a giving kiosk. And you can go up and you can use your credit card. And you can do your offering on your way into church in no fuss, no muss. You can have a receipt if you want one. But you don't have to worry about that whole plate coming by. Which doesn't address the guilt issue, right? If you're people like we are who don't give every week, but we're monthly givers, in North Carolina, even worse, poor Wendy, because we would give to one church one month and the other church the next month, which meant weeks would go by when the offering plate comes. And you know if you're not a weekly giver, you know what that's like, right? You have to do the sort of put your hand up. <laughs> or the knowing smile, don't worry, we've got it, just not today. Or you take it and you quickly pass it to the person next to you and you hope, what are they thinking about me because I just passed the plate and I didn't put anything in it. And I have friends who always, even if they write a check, will throw a couple of dollars in there because they don't want to look bad. So I think the kiosk in the narthex doesn't help you with the guilt at all um, of what do you do with the offering plate when it comes by. So churches are doing that and so making it easy and convenient for you to give. And I think, have you not read the Gospel of John? Because one of the things that Jesus seems to be upset about is these folks who are trying to make it convenient. Now, he's not really worried that it's too convenient. Something I think entirely different is going on here. He is so upset at the money changes and the animals being in the temple courts that he makes a whip out of cords and he drives them all out of the temple area. Sheep and cattle, he scatters the coins of the money changers and he tells the, those who are selling doves, get these out of here. You're turning my father's house into a marketplace. Why is he so very upset? I had to choose what Old Testament passage I wanted Dave to read this morning. And I love this one from Malachi because it fits this situation wonderfully, right? Behold, the messenger you are seeking, the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. God shows up to his temple. The one whom you desire, the one whom you long for, the one in whom you delight will come. And who can stand at the day of his coming? Who can endure the day of his coming? Well, that's what happened to all these vendors, right? They just took off. One guy with a not very impressive whip, it's not meant to hurt, it's meant to encourage the animals to go their way, is able to drive everything out and completely overturn everything that's going on. Well, of course, this is part of what's going on. God shows up to his temple. Jesus, who is God, shows up. The trickier one that I couldn't figure out how to split up, and so I wasn't going to ask the liturgist to read this, comes from the book right before Malachi, Zechariah. And the very end of that book Two very important ideas. The very last sentence of the book of Zechariah says this. And on that day, the day of the Lord, there will no longer be a merchant in the house of the Lord Almighty. If you want to know why there are merchants in the house, you kind of got to read the whole book of Zechariah. But on that day, no longer a tradesperson in the house, which doesn't mean if you were a merchant, you didn't get to come to church. It meant you didn't get to do that business there. Because, among other things, a few verses back, it says in verse 16, Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem, former enemies of the people of God, will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the various feasts there. Okay. When you picture the temple, you need to picture a pretty big complex. And the word that has been used so far is the word for the whole temple mount, all the buildings, all the courtyards. And it talks about the temple courts, right? If you were a Gentile, not a Jew, who wanted to worship the one true God, you got in the first ring, as it were, into the first courtyard, the courtyard of the Gentiles, the outermost courts. That's where you got to worship and pray. If you were a Jewish woman, you got to go one ring in closer, okay? So you get to the next court, the court of the women. 
If you were a Jewish man, which was evidently the place to be, you got to go even farther and even closer to the holy place. And then there, of course, was in the middle the holy place, which is the holy of holies where God's glory dwelt, the holy place around it, and the vestibule leading in. Only the high priest gets to go into the holy of holies, and only once a year. And no one else can go in. So they tie a rope around his ankle in case he dies in there, so you can drag him out rather than going into the holy of holies, because then you would die too, honestly. Also bells on his robe so you can hear that he's still moving around. Are you still okay? Don't want to bother the high priest when he's in the Holy of Holies. So you hear the bells, he must be all right. If you quit hearing the bells, you give the rope a tug and see how he's doing. There are places you're allowed to worship and places you're not allowed to worship. If the vision and the prophecy of Zechariah is that one day all nations, all peoples get to worship the one true God, where are they going to do that? If they're not Jews... If they're not Jewish men, they don't get to come the closest in. And if they're not Jewish women, they don't get to come one ring out from that. You're in the outermost courts, the courts of the Gentiles. Where do you think all these animals and all these money changers were? They weren't in the court of the women, and they weren't in the innermost court. They were out in the court of the Gentiles. So to make sense of why Jesus is so upset, the thing I find most convincing is that the vision of God is that all peoples will get to worship. Think about if you got to come to worship and wherever you were allowed to sit was also where the cattle and the sheep and the doves and the people changing money were. And that's the only place you can pray and the only place you can worship. There's business going on. There are animals going on, doing all the things that animals do right there where you're worshiping. That is not a vision of the open doors of the temple of God that all may come in and worship there. And I think that is probably why Jesus enacted this prophecy. It's a symbolic uh, thing that he's doing. He drives them out because they're not supposed to be there. Where are they supposed to be? Actually, the animal people are supposed to be across the Kidron Valley on the Mount of Olives. Not very awfully far away. Less convenient, perhaps, but the animals aren't in church. Just saw a sign for the blessing of the animals uh, over in Williamsport coming up today, I think. And that just, sorry, that vision just suddenly came to mind. Um, Are the animals allowed in church or not? Well, in certain circles, yes. But that's not what our point is today. The animals are keeping the people from worshiping. No, drive them out. The money changer also. They're supposed to be there. you got to change your currency. But not in the place of worship because it's for worship. It's not for these other things. Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? And then his disciples remembered this psalm, Psalm 69. Zeal for your house will consume me. So eager, so excited about coming to the presence of a holy God that it just devours him. It consumes him. It's overwhelming. It's one of those things where literally preaching to the choir and to you, I am so happy that you're here today, but I hope that you're here not because this is what you do at this time on Sundays, but rather because there is this drive, there is this earnestness, there is this enthusiasm, this zeal to get to worship God. There's a God to be worshipped, and here are God's people worshipping together. For Jesus, it was overwhelming, and he didn't want anything to keep you and me from being able to worship God. So he started with the temple and later, of course, gave himself up that we might be God's own and come face to face one day with the Lord Almighty and not be consumed, but rather welcomed into the family of God. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? That was my question number three this morning. How do they know to ask him about a miracle? Has he been doing other miracles? All we know in this gospel is he turned the water into wine. What else has he been doing? Well, he may or may not have been doing miracles along the way because it says there in verse 23 that while he was there at the feast, he did many miraculous signs. So he is starting to show some of the power of God in this setting. Whether he's done it yet or not is actually not the most important question though I wrote it down as question number three, because it's not so much show us the stuff, show us the miraculous signs. This is the amazing thing. If somebody has come in, say we were here worshiping, trying to worship together, and somebody came in and just raised a ruckus and caught everybody's attention and started driving some people out of church and others get to stay, we would want to know, what are you doing and why are you doing this? They don't ask him why he does what he does. They ask him, Who gave you the authority to do what you're doing? Which may explain why all the cattle, all the sheep, all the doves, all the people taking care of them, and all the money changers are willing to leave the temple when Jesus gets so upset. Because they knew we're not supposed to be here. 
I mean, the priest said we could be here, but this isn't really where we're supposed to be. And yeah, these poor Gentiles can't really worship with all these animals and business going on. And it's almost as if their consciences let them know as soon as he said, get out of here. That's right. We were going to get out of here anyway. I mean, I don't know what you think of when you think of Jesus driving them out, whether it's the power of God and how dare they stand before him. But also it may be that they knew this isn't where we're supposed to be. And as soon as he said, are you supposed to be here? Let's all go. Let's just go now. They didn't say, why are you doing what you're doing? They don't question the driving out the animals and the money changers. They rather ask, what can you show us to prove that you are the right person to do this? So not what you're doing, but who are you that you can do this? Are you the right person to be able to do this cleansing of the temple? What can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? You're acting like a Messiah. Can you show us that you are a chosen one of God? that you can do these things. He gives them a great sign. They don't understand it. Jesus answered, destroy this temple. Important, because you're going to miss this, because there's no way you would know it. The word we've been using for temple so far is the whole big building, all right? The whole, the whole kit and caboodle, all the courts, all the buildings, all the everything. When Jesus uses temple here, he actually chooses a different word, and he means the holy place, where God's glory dwells, the dwelling place of God. Destroy this sanctuary, this dwelling place of God, this holy place. It is temple, but this holy place, and I will raise it again in three days. Now, they don't switch to the other word. They, they, grant, they give him this word. We'll give you this one, that same sanctuary, temple, holy place, dwelling place of God. Destroy it, and I'll raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, to build this place. And you're going to raise it in three days? The amazing thing is they had taken 46 years and they weren't through yet. Herod the Great began this temple in 19 B.C. At this time, 46 years later, we're at the Passover of 27 or 28 A.D. It is not going to be completed until 63 A.D., just in time for it to be finished and utterly destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D., never to be rebuilt. Most of it was done in 10 years. 46 years later, they're still at work. Till 63 AD, they will finally finish it. And then seven years later, it's gone forever. It's taken all this time to build this. You're going to raise it up again in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. The dwelling place of God. God made flesh is dwelling among them, full of grace and truth. And Jesus, all the glory of God dwelled. And he is talking about the holy of holies that was himself, God in flesh. That temple, that sanctuary, that holy of holies. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Actually, almost everybody remembered something about this encounter. Because when Jesus is put on trial much later, years later, according to John's account, people are remembering. He said something about the temple in three days. Those are the false accusations brought against him, but the witnesses don't agree with one another. But their major beef with him was, well, he said something about destroying the temple, and then he was going to raise it, build it again. The temple made with human hands, and he was going to build a temple not made by human hands. But on the night of his trial, they couldn't get their stories together, and they couldn't get it straight, and... They had to convict him anyway. That was their whole plan, right? Uh, but the witnesses certainly weren't agreeing. Years later, people remembered something about this day. He said something about the temple in three days. The disciples get it. The thing I love about this gospel is that even though John doesn't tell us until chapter 20, almost the very end, why did he do this gospel? Why did he write it down? He wrote it down so that you and I could get to know Jesus. And getting to know him, have faith in him, believe in him, and believing in him, have life in his name. That's the purpose of the whole gospel. It tells us at the end instead of the beginning. But all along the way, the disciples show us that this life of faith is a journey and it is a, a maturing and growing thing because they keep getting it a little bit, but they don't get the whole thing. And then they seem to grow a little more, understand a little bit more. So after he was raised from the dead, they remembered this day when he said, destroy this temple, I'll raise it in three days. On the third day, on Easter Sunday, he was raised from the dead. They remembered, and then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. But just last week, they put their faith in him, right? He thus revealed his glory, and the disciples believed in him. They put their faith in him, and it is a growing thing. It is a journey uh, that we get to embark upon this following Jesus and believing in him. And God is pleased by his spirit to grow us up in our faith, to mature us in our faith. They don't get everything at the beginning. Even on Easter Sunday, 
John's going to run into the tomb and he's going to see the empty grave cloths there and see the empty tomb and he's going to believe, but he still doesn't seem to get it. He believed, but he didn't really know. And we'll talk about that on Easter Sunday. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was there in Jerusalem, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing. So some of his power and glory is being shown. And many believed in his name. But it doesn't seem to be the absolute, fully committed, all-in, transforming belief uh, because Jesus does not entrust himself to them. They believe the signs. They believe the power. But do they believe in him as the Son of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Not all of them, and certainly not yet. But it is a growth thing. They're on their way. They see some things that completely change how they look at him. John wants them to grow up into full faith, into full maturity of their faith. He would not entrust himself to them because we see at different points they want to make him king, they want to make him a political leader, they want him to throw out the Romans and do other things that will suit them well. He wouldn't entrust himself to them because they need, we need, we all need, they and us both need Jesus to be the Savior that God sent. Not whatever God we can make in our own image, not whatever God we can fit into our own little box, but the God who is both meek and mild teacher, being very gentle, and also the power of God shown in driving out, cleansing the temple, uh, showing the holiness of God and the importance of worship of God. Jesus knew all people. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. And that's a tip-off for the next two chapters, where Jesus is going to show that he knows what people are thinking, and he knows all about them before they say anything about themselves. Jesus knows us inside and out. He knows the heart, because he is God, the word of God, made flesh, dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. For me, it's a pretty exciting point in the story to drive out all the animals with the whip and the dust, and the noise, and the commotion. For John, the important thing is this prophecy. What sign can you show us? Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Here, the Holy of Holies, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, offers himself up for you and for me, that we might also believe in him. I was being provocative with my sermon title today. I usually have trouble with that. But I wanted you to think of this in two different ways. First, all the people there going, do you believe this guy? What is this guy doing? He's causing a huge commotion and causing a huge ruckus. Can you believe what he's doing? They start there. But where they end up and where John wants you and me to end up is, do you believe this guy? Not just some guy, not some meek and mild teacher, but the son of God, king of kings and lord of lords. Do you believe in him? Will you let the spirit grow your faith up in him? Uh, this one who has come to usher us into the presence of God, that we too might worship him in spirit and truth. Will you please join me in prayer? God, be gracious to us. Uh, be gracious to us because it's too easy uh, to come into this place expecting to sing and to pray and to hear your word, forgetting that this is the place of worship. This is where you meet us, where you meet us in your word and where you meet us in brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us also to have zeal for your worship, for the place where you meet with us. Help us also to have zeal for the one you have sent, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray in his name. Amen.